Fender Precision Bass made in the year 1960. This is a time when many of the instruments had less red in the sunburst, and what red they did have tended to fade out, so it ends up with a two-tone sunburst look by the time it's this age. The metal bridge cover and the metal cover over the pickups have been removed, as most players did, because they simply get in the way. But Leo Fender still insisted on putting metal covers over them as long as he was affiliated with Fender. It's been well played so far as belt buckle wear, but it is of interest to note that Fender is the company that introduced the first successful fretted electric bass. AudioVox in Seattle had produced fretted solid body electric basses as early as the mid 1930s and also had amplifiers. But the necks were not as comfortable as Fender. The amplifiers were not as powerful. The instruments simply didn't take off and were not commercially successful. I'm none too sure that Leo Fender even had ever seen or heard of an audio box. They were made in such limited quantities that I truly believe that Leo Fender came up with the concept of an electric fretted bass independently and probably without prior knowledge of audio box in spite of the fact that we can't claim that the Fender was the first fretted electric bass, we can at least claim it was the first commercially successful one. When the Precision Bass came out in 1951, it was quite a different looking beast from this. It had a body shape more close to the Fender Telecaster and squared off sides, did not have the contoured body that this has. This is the contoured body, very similar to the Stratocaster that came out in 54 and in fact at that time the precision base was modified to have a contour body like the Stratocaster. The early precision base did not have this split pickup but had instead a straight pickup similar in design to a Telecaster pickup and also had a smaller peg head that rather than this peg head, which looks quite a bit like a Stratocaster peg head, the early precision bass prior to mid-57 had a peg head shape just like an enlarged Telecaster guitar peg head. This bass features a maple neck with a rosewood thick slab fingerboard of the type first introduced in late 59. So we can see a board that's flat on the bottom, curved on the top. By mid-62, this thick slab construction had been abandoned in favor of a rosewood veneer that used less wood. But this is still a very fine instrument not in what I would consider pristine conditions such that a collector who wants mint condition instruments would go for it, but certainly a golden era piece so far as quality and for a musician. This is a bass you can take on stage, get a great result, and not have to worry that you might get a scratch on it. Today, Fender as well as Gibson and many other makers, are doing relic instruments where people are paying them extra to produce the kind of wear that this comes with. But when selling a vintage instrument, we get significantly less money for one with wear 
hair such as this than one that looks pristine. When Fender and others who do relic instruments produce new instruments, they charge extra. And if you get a relic treated instrument new and you get an extra scratch on it, its value stays the same. If you buy one like this, then you get an extra scratch on it because you were using it on stage. Unless you absolutely beat the crap out of it, its value will also stay the same. So from a musician's point of view, if you're buying a utilitarian instrument, getting something that is a golden era piece because it plays and sounds the best of anything Fender or whatever manufacturer you may choose, built, if it was a golden era for that maker, that's something that a musician can be proud of to use, whereas the collector may go for something that is squeaky clean. It's also worth noting that golden era is not a specific year for everything. The golden era for each maker can be different. For Fender, it's the pre-CBS years, which means prior to 65 is pre-CBS, but for the most part, up through mid-65, they still, even though CBS owned them, they were using up the pre-CBS parts and the workmanship didn't change right away. So really, they don't start looking or feeling or sounding like a CBS model until late 65. For some of the banjo makers, like Vega, their best instruments were very early pre-1920 for some of the absolute best. For Gibson mandolins, 1922 through December of 24 it was the lore period. Those are the ones that bring the most money, but they still made great mandolins right on into the mid-30s. And the ones pre-lore are also, in many cases, great mandolins, although not great bluegrass mandolins. But the point is, again, different makers have different periods that may be their best. But this is still an instrument that, as Fender basses go, is a golden era instrument of very high quality bass. And also is pretty much the culmination of the design of this model. Because I've already outlined a series of changes that the precision bass went through from its introduction in 51 through mid-57 and onward into late 59 when it got the rosewood fingerboard like this. After this, I can't claim that anything that happened to the P bass made it better. To me, the ultimate rosewood P bass is this period, late 59 through mid-62. But for jazz basses, the ultimate bass is also the very early ones. But the jazz bass didn't get introduced until 60. 60 on into early 62 with the concentric knobs are the ultimate jazz basses. And they happen to be also with the thick slab rosewood fingerboard like this. This is a fine bass. Mm -hmm.